The movie, The Count of Monte Cristo, tells the story told in the book of the same title, the classic novel written by Alexandre Dumas. Edmond Dantes, the hero of the book, is arrested and thrown into the dreaded Chateau d'If, that rock island prison in the France of its day. It's a terrible story, but one that draws the listener, the viewer, in. In this particular scene of the movie, Edmund is being escorted, if I can say it that way, by the evil prison warden, Dorliac. Escorted not first to his cell when he arrives at the Chateau d'If, but escorted to a, to, to a room where he will be tortured. As they walk in that direction, there is a piece of writing on the wall that says, God will give me justice. Dorliac mocks that sentiment. He says, we like to help prisoners keep track of the amount of time they have spent here at the Chateau d'If so that every year on their birthday, we give them a little something to mark the year. He's meaning that he tortures them on every anniversary of their entrance into the prison. He says, we'll help you remember. Edmund tells Dorliac, God is watching. And Dorliac merely laughs, scoffs at that idea. He says, God, God has nothing to do with this. To which Edmund says, God has everything to do with it. And Dorliac then says, all right, I'll make a bargain with you, Dantes. Here's my bargain. I'm going to start beating you. You ask God to show up, and when God shows up, I'll stop. And they string Dante's up to make the beating easier. I'll make a bargain with you. You ask God for help, and when God shows up, I'll stop. It brings us face to face with the concept of the providence of God. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here. It's a big limb, so I think I'll be safe. I'm going to go out on a limb and make the assumption that you believe in the providence of God. I mean, after all, this is church. It's in a bit of a different format, but it's church. We come together, sing together, pray together give of our tithes and offerings. We read scripture. We listen to teaching. I, I think it's a fair assumption that most of us in some manner believe in the providence of God. But then we have to be honest and say, then along comes an Edmund Dantes, done deeply wrong. Along comes a Naomi. Along comes a Ruth. And suddenly it's not so easy anymore. In fact, in the lives of Naomi and Ruth, what if we were to get out a microscope? If we were to take a microscope and focus down on the details of their lives, one at, our time, one at a time, putting our eye to the microscope, examining with great care every incident in their lives, would we see the providence of God? Would it be there? In all of those events that transpire throughout the years told in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament? I mean, after all, there are scholars and not a small number who contend that the providence of God is key to the understanding of the book of Ruth. This is one representative quote of that mindset by David Atkinson. He says this, If there is one theme more than any other which dominates the book of Ruth, it is that of the overruling providence of God and our human dependence on Him. God is the source of life. Life and its blessings are a gift from His hand. So what is it that Atkinson says? If, if there's anything that dominates the book, he says, it is that of the overruling providence of God. So we take that microscope and we, we look, we carefully examine every incident of their lives. Famine, hunger, foreigners, a funeral, another funeral, another funeral, 
And pretty soon we turn away from the microscope and say, there's too much. And it's beginning to look too familiar. Where here can we see, as Atkinson said, the providence of God? And so the curtain rises on Act 4, the marriage. And no sooner does the curtain rise on this act <clears throat> than we are once again back into that issue of the providence of God. We've seen what happens in chapter 4, verse 1 before, back in Act 2. You remember when, when Ruth just happened to find the field of Boaz, or more literally translated, happened to happen to find the field? Luck, fate, or a divine hand? Well, as, as Act 4 begins, we're right back in the same boat. Because in this act, there is an encounter that is, well, is it providential? In fact, we're going to read about someone, a man, who walks by, just happens to walk by at exactly the right moment. In fact, the more literal translation of the Hebrew is, he wandered by, so-and-so wandered by. And it just happened to be at the exact right moment. So let's read as the act begins, Ruth 4, verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate, that's where they transacted business in that day and time, went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the family guardian he had mentioned came along, wondered by. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. My friend, he calls him. Why doesn't he call him by name? Certainly Boaz would have known his name. Bethlehem was a small village. Everybody knows everybody's name. And this is a family member. And yet the text calls him my friend. Scholars think that this is the narrator's way of demeaning and diminishing the role of this family guardian. I won't even name him, not only because he's not important enough, but because of what he does. And in fact, those words, my friend, are translated by a wordplay in the Hebrew. Peloni almoni. It's an interesting wordplay. It's the kind of wordplay that, that takes words that may be nonsensical and joins them together, and then everybody gets the meaning. We have those in English. Hodgepodge. Hocus pocus. Heebie-jeebies. Helter-skelter. You know exactly what I mean by each of those terms, and yet the words, they, they really don't make all that much sense. That's what happens here. Scholars say the best way to translate that word here in this context is so-and-so. And so this act opens when so-and-so just happens to wander by. Happenstance or providence. Let's read what happens next. Ruth 4, beginning in verse 2. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the family guardian, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this the family guardian said, and I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the family guardian said to Boaz, Buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as 
as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among the family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Boaz is strategic. He lives out a simple statement that one of his descendants much later will make. When Jesus said, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. So in the family gate where business was transacted, he talks to this Goel, this kinsman redeemer, this family guardian. He says to him, you know, Naomi has come back. She's back from Moab. It's time that we deal with the property that had belonged to Elimelech. So you're the closest family guardian. Do you want to buy it? And immediately this man responds, I'll redeem it. And then Boaz says, oh, by the way, um, I, I think maybe I forgot to mention, along with the redemption of the land comes Ruth. And he adds, the Moabite. Just a little reminder there, she's a foreign widow. Along with the redemption of the land comes Ruth the Moabite. And it's your obligation, it will be, to have a son with Ruth, raise that son in Malin's name, her dead husband, and then the land that you secure here today will go to him. Just so you know that. And immediately, this family guardian says, well, I can't do that. That'll cost me. That risks my own estate. Can't do that. You do it. So Boaz says, all right. Well, let's sign on the dotted line then, so-and-so. And they do. The sandal is exchanged and the deal is done. Providence, happenstance. We can get out that microscope and go over every scene from the life of Naomi and Ruth, trying to detect the finger of providence guiding. Where is it? Is it there in the famine? In the deaths? Is it there when, when Ruth just happened to find the field of Boaz? What if she hadn't happened upon that land? What if Boaz, rather than being a man of integrity, had been a selfish man? What if Boaz and Naomi hadn't been related? What if this so-and-so that we meet in chapter 4 hadn't been selfish? What if, what if, what if? We're, we're gazing through the microscope trying to detect the providence of God. It's easy to say, yes, 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 there's the providence of God. But we do have to have some care with that. That's reflected in the words of the late Vance Havner, preacher, author, wrote many books, who writes this, I get a little weary of these dear souls who have all the dealing and doing of providence cataloged and correlated and figured out and can give you glib little answers to your heartache. They haven't been far. God just doesn't operate on our timetable. And some of His operations don't add up on our computers. The little boy who didn't understand why God put so many vitamins in spinach and didn't put more of them in ice cream had a pretty good idea that it just doesn't work out like you'd think. That rings true, doesn't it? That has the feel of authenticity to it. Where do we find the providence of God 
as we peer through the microscope at Naomi's and Ruth's lives. And now something else happens. Marriage. You remember the old, old rhyme? First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Ruth pushing a baby carriage. Well, that's exactly what happens here. Back to Ruth chapter 4. As we witness the closing scenes, the closing times of this saga of anguish and joy. Verse 13, So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a family guardian. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. When the curtain rose on act one of this saga of anguish and joy, we could hear three widows weeping. We could see the tears streaking their faces. But now as the curtain begins to descend on act four, we see an older widow laughing and a younger now wife filled with joy at the birth of a child. Is it the providence of God? After all that has happened, after we peer through that microscope trying to detect, trying to find evidences of the providence of God, trying to find the fingerprints of God on the different scenes of these lives, are we now seeing it? Once upon a time, in a land far away, there was a very poor man. But for all of his poverty, he owned a magnificent white stallion. So magnificent was the stallion that the king wanted to buy it from him, offering him significant riches. But the man said no. And the people of the village taunted him. Oh, man, you are foolish. That's the worst choice you could have made. And the old man merely said, It's too early to tell. And then one day the stallion escaped, galloped away. The man was crestfallen, heartbroken, and the people of the village said, Oh man, you should have sold the horse to the king. Had you sold him, you would now be wealthy. Now you have neither money nor horse. It's a tragedy. And the old man said, It's too early to tell. And then about two weeks later, the horse returned bringing with him three other white stallions. And the people of the village said, Oh man, what a stroke of genius! Now you can sell one to the king and still have three. You will be rich and set for life. What a blessing! And the old man said, It's too early to tell. About two months later, the old man's son was trying to break, trying to tame one of the new stallions when the new stallion reared up and fell over and landed on the young man's legs, crushing them and paralyzing him. And the people of the village said, Oh man, how ridiculous. Trying to tame those stallions. Now your son is paralyzed, may never recover. What a waste. And the old man said, it's too early to tell. Later that year, their country went to war with a neighboring land. The king's men came through conscripting all of the young men in the village, taking them to the battle, the battle where they would all perish. And they took them all except 
the young man, still recovering. And the people said, amazing old man, because of the accident, he still lives. What a blessing. And the old man said, it's too early to tell. Reflecting on those sentiments, and maybe even on the sentiment of that line, it's too early to tell. The Old Testament scholar K. Lawson Younger writes this, In a fallen world that has lost all direction and certainty, the book of Ruth reaffirms time and again the sovereignty and providence of God. Just as God demonstrated his hesed through Boaz to the two widows, he demonstrates his loving faithfulness and loyalty to his people today through individuals living out the spirit of his word, motivated by loving commitment to people in need. God's hesed, God's covenant love and faithfulness, restored Naomi and it restores us. As with Naomi, sometimes the process seems slow from a human standpoint, but gradually and definitely, God acts to bring us back. Gradually and definitely and slowly. It's too early to tell. In fact, it just could be that a microscope looking at the lives of Ruth and Naomi is itself too limiting of a perspective. Maybe we need a much larger perspective, especially in light of the way the story ends. In fact, the final verses of the story, which we might be tempted to overlook because they're primarily just names, it's just a list of names, may give us a deep insight into God's providence. In fact, there are some scholars who say that these verses right here at the very end are the reason the book of Ruth was written. Ruth chapter 4, verse 18. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amenadab, Amenadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. There are some scholars who believe that the book of Ruth was written to show God protecting the family line of King David and ultimately protecting the family line of King Jesus. Surely a microscope is too small to see that. David Atkins, an Old Testament scholar, underlines that large view with these words. And when Christ our Savior was born of David's line in that same Bethlehem, he was born into a family of ordinary people. And they too, by their willing obedience to the God who is gracious, focused most clearly in Mary's prayer, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word were instruments of God's providential purposes in His world. Our faith, our ordinary lives, our decisions too, are part of God's providential and gracious care. We today are part of the covenant family whose first father was Abraham and which gave a welcome also to Ruth, the girl from Moab. We share in an interconnectedness of family life from their times until now. The God who called Ruth is the God who calls us in Christ. May we, like Ruth, like Mary, her great descendant, pledge our willing and loving obedience in response to God's gracious invitation to enjoy our place under the refuge of His wings. Maybe what we need to do, if we are ever going to see the evidence of the providence of God, is we need to back away 
from the extreme specificity of every detail. We need to walk away from the microscope. We need to get far enough back where we can look through the telescope. Look through the telescope and see the grand sweep before us. Because to fully understand the providence of God means we must peer not through a microscope, but that we must gaze through a telescope at the grand narrative, not only of our lives, but of the history of the people of God. And it just happens. It just so happens that two women, two widows, help us see that vista very clearly. But you know, there was another woman. Another woman named Ellen White, who with these very sentiments in mind, wrote these words. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Amen.